Okay, we've talked about the sonnet, so now let's turn to the sestina. So if you remember, the sonnet is a 14-line poem. Um, it can work a couple different ways. We looked at a Shakespearean sonnet, um, so that had the 12 lines and then a couple at the end where the shift sort of begins. Sometimes you can have a Petrarchan or Italian sonnet where you have an octave and a sestet, and so the ideas shift not in the couplet at the end, but after the first eight moving into the final six lines. So that's the sonnet, but now we're going to tackle the sestina. So hopefully you've read this already. If you haven't, pause the video, go read it, come back. Um, and as you were reading, hopefully you noticed that there was some formal quality about it. We don't have a rhyme scheme, but there is a repetition, right? So what's being repeated? Well, that's, that's what a sestina is. So a sestina is a poem that has seven stanzas, and it has the first six stanzas are of six lines each. The final stanza, or the envoy, is a tercet, or three lines. And the, the stanzas end with the same words in different orders. So hopefully you noticed that the words, or some form of the words, were repeated at the end of each line in each stanza. So we have said, English, closed, words, nombres, and Spanish. Okay, So that's the form of the sestina. Um, we have those six words, they end the lines. Um, the final word of the last line in one stanza becomes the final word of the first line of the next stanza. So the last line of the first stanza and the second line of the second stanza are from that first world I can't translate from Spanish Gladys, Rosario, Altagracia, the sounds of Spanish. So Spanish is repeated in the final line of the first stanza and the first line of the second stanza. And then there's a rigid scheme that you're supposed to follow. I'm not going to cover that now because it'll probably bore the hell out of you. But if you're interested, you can look it up. Um, so the Sistina is actually pretty tough to write. Um, if you go back, if you read in your book um, the description of the sonnet, it says, so great was the vogue for sonnets in England at the end of the 16th century that a gentleman might have been thought a bore if he couldn't turn out a decent one. Um, so writing a sonnet, maybe not all that difficult. A rhyme scheme like that is kind of easy to wrap your head around, that little surprise at the end. But it is really hard to write a good Sistina. Um, there are very few of them around. This is one that I think is really good. There is an Elizabeth Bishop uh, Sistina in your textbook. But I chose this one because I think that the, again, the form informs the content of what's happening in the poem. Um, so let's talk about these ending words, right? Because the Sistina is all about, it's a very formal poem, and it's all about the repetition of these words. And we're talking about fixed forms, right? Which means that the words should say exa stay exactly the same each time that they're repeated. But do they? And in fact, they don't. Um, the only word that stays intact each time it's repeated is Spanish. All the other words change in some way. Excuse me, I'm getting thirsty after all these videos. So we had in the first stanza said, which changes in other stanzas to say or saying. We have English repeated mostly the same, but then in the, the envoy in the final stanza, it turns to the Spanish word inglés. Closed is used for the first four or five stanzas, but then changes to close or close. We have words, word, we have words, word is, and world being used for words. We have nombres, nombre, names, and numbering. These are all variations on that word. And like I said, Spanish stays intact. So maybe that's just convenient for the author because it's really, it's like hella hard to write a, a sestina where you use these six words and never vary them in any sort of way. I've tried sestinas. They're like ridiculously difficult. They're kind of fun, but you end up just sort of throwing the poem away at the end. So that's why I want to talk about one that I think stands up. And I think it stands up because the way that she tweaks the words, I think, is relevant to what's happening in the poem. What is the poem? You know, here's the question. What is the poem about, right? Well, its title is Bilingual Sestina. And two of the words that are being used at the end of lines are English and Spanish. And the poem is essentially about, you know, the, the participation in these two different languages. Um, there are a couple of lines here. Uh, how saying its name will always summon up in Spanish or English the full-blown genie of the bottled nombre. And then in the end, um, words so close to what I mean that I almost hear my Spanish. So it's about the, the gradual learning of a second language and how you fill in the gaps. And I've tried to learn other languages, right? Um, German and a little bit of Spanish. And when you get stuck, what happens, right? So if I'm speaking in German and then I find a word that I don't know, what do I do? Well, I substitute an English word, right? Um, 
The same thing will happen for other people. We've probably heard the word Spanglish, which is probably not PC, but kind of the, the intermixing of Spanish and English. And it's not just Spanglish that it happens in, it happens in all sorts of languages, right? So when you're trying to speak and you get stuck, then you fill in with your native language. And that seems to be kind of the experience of what's going on in the poem. Um, so I think that it's interesting. And I, I just want to talk about this one substitution of words. So this is in the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth stanza. Um, so one of our, our ending words is nombres, right? What does that mean in Spanish? It means name, okay? So which is why in the final stanza, the envoy, she uses names instead of nombres. Nombres does not appear in the envoy. Instead, the envoy reads, their names and intimacy I now yearn for in English, words so close to what I mean that I almost hear my Spanish heart beating, beating inside what I say in English. So she substitutes names for nombres, right? Which makes sense because it's the, the English equivalent to that. But if we look at stanza five, and this is the second line of stanza five, she doesn't use nombres and she doesn't use names. She uses this word numbering. Um, so I'll read the first couple lines of this. Actually, I will continue. I'll start in the previous stanza with the, the first, so I'll read the entire sentence. Rosario, muse of El Patio, sing to me and through me say that world again. Begin first with those words you put into my mouth as you pointed to the world. Not Adam, not God, but a country girl numbering the stars, the blades of grass, warming the sun by saying, que calor. So, I was first exposed to this poem when I was an undergraduate student, so around the age you guys are at. Um, so same sort of experience in college. It was uh, an introduction to poetry course. And the, the professor asked, why this shift from nombres to numbering? And why, you know, should, she, should we let her get away with that? Is it just the poet being lazy and saying, man, it's really tough to use nombres in this situation, so I'm going to use numbering? Um, and here's my opinion. I don't think it is the poet being lazy. I think it's the poet making a really conscious choice and a choice that really reflects on what the whole poem is doing. So if you think about nombres and you think about numbering, do they look the same or the, the name number and the name nombre? We have N-O-M-B-R-E in Spanish and N-U-M-B-E-R in English, right? So we would think that, anybody know what a cognate is? A cognate is when you have a word from another language that generates a word in another lang in some subsequent language, right? Um, so there are a lot of Span Spanish words that are very similar to English words, and those are called cognates. What we have here with nombre and numbers is a false cognate. Um, you think that number looks like nombre. This is probably a, a, a problem anybody's had who's taken Spanish for the first time. When you see nombre, you think that it means number because they look similar, right? There's only a couple differences in letters. There's an O instead of a U, and the E and R are switched at the end. But it's actually a false cognate because nombre does not mean number. It means name. But she chooses to use this word number or numbering in this stanza. And I think that's important because the whole poem is about these two languages, right? And how things don't always line up. How one idea is not always expressible, you know, and, and a thought in Spanish is, does not always have an equivalent translation in English. Um, and I think that's, I think the poem is, is in a way all about the false cognate, how not everything is translatable. And so I think that's why she chose this word numbering because it looks like nombres, but it doesn't mean anything at all like nombres, right? Which is sometimes our experience with language. Um, the things don't always translate. So when we're talking about fixed forms, there is a lot of room for, for fudging it, you know, if you want to call it that, um, for changing the words. We saw it in a couple of the poems, the rhyme schemes, where the rhyme schemes are not exact. They're not full rhymes. They're half rhymes. Um, and in the Sistina, I have yet, I think, to see a Sistina where there isn't at least some liberty taken with these ending words. And I don't think it's just liberty being taken in this fifth stanza when she goes from nombres to numbering. I think it's a conscious choice that reflects back on, on the quality of the whole poem um, and this idea that what you understand in, in Spanish does not always equate to the English word. And so I think that she's playing on this idea of the false cognate. And again, it's just to reiterate this idea that, I mean, this is a formal quality, right? She's tweaking the form of the poem, but by doing that, it has a consequence on the content of the poem. And so we're gonna continue talking about form and content. And I think this is one way that you can see that played out in this kind of poem.